and welcome to the Rays of Hope program brought to you by the Purchase Area Sexual Assault and Child Advocacy Center. I'm your host today, Mary Foley, and I thank you so much for joining us for another informative and I hope inspirational program for you. Oftentimes when I sit before you, we talk about topics such as child sexual abuse, sexual assault, victim advocacy, common reactions to trauma, things that you need to do as a community member to ensure that you and those that you love are safe. But rarely do we have the opportunity to let you hear the story of a victim from their own perspective, from their own mouth, from their own heart. And today you're going to have that opportunity. So it is my privilege to welcome you to the program today and my privilege to welcome you, Mindy, uh, to the program. Thank you so much for being willing to be a part of today's show. Thank you. Well, you have quite a story to tell. So rather than take up any more of, uh, of our time with introductions, what I'd like for you to do is just introduce uh, yourself, your story uh, to our viewer, uh, and we'll just go from there today. Okay. Um, I was 27 years old, mm -hmm. and um, I was divorced, single mother, and I had found myself uh, getting out of a very volatile marriage. Uh, and about a year later, started dating a man that was wonderful. He was mm -hmm. good to me, good to my daughter, and we couldn't ask for anything better. Um, he became involved with my family. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, soon married and uh, bought a home. We had um, another son, and we were ball coaches, you know, just mm -hmm. good old American family. Mm -hmm. So um, after the birth of my son, uh, David started, his, his personality started to change a bit. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that the relationship that he had had with my daughter was beginning to change. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I thought this was um, some do because, you know, my son was born and she was no longer the only child and not sure. getting all the attention sure. and that kind of thing. So um, is the relationship with David started to decline mm -hmm. and uh, Brianna became more and more resentful toward him. Um, you know, I didn't, I still didn't have any reason to doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that was going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, when you uh, say that, let me just interrupt you here just a moment. Uh, when you say um, the relationship between you and your spouse at that time began to decline, uh, and when you say she became more resentful, what, what do you mean? Uh, she became more resentful uh, toward him. Mm -hmm. You know, the relationship that they once had, you know, as her ball coach, is the guy that threw her in the air and packed her around on his shoulders and mm -hmm. helped her to mow the lawn and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Sure. That was gone. And he was no more, uh, he wasn't involved in her life as much, and uh -huh. she didn't want him there. I see. So there seemed to be some sort of pulling away. Some or, sort of friction between uh, friction them. Friction between, yes. tension between them. And how did that tension affect your marriage relationship? Um, I think it affected it greatly because, you know, prior to that, my daughter and I had been uh, just the two of us for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always talked about this was, we're a team, we're, we're mm -hmm. the girls. And mm -hmm. so we um, had this relationship that was very, very close. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so what happened? His behavior began to change mm -hmm. and um, I didn't think that we could work things out. So um, he started to do some uh, things that weren't normal. Mm -hmm. um, he did things, he, he threw away my clothes. He would have the electricity turned off. He, um, we owned a business together, mm -hmm. and he did things to sabotage the business. Mm -hmm. uh, he, t he tapped my phone and put surveillance on our computer so that uh, he could have access to bank accounts and things like that. So he became very controlling of you. Yes, okay. absolutely. Um, after filing for a divorce um, and having an EPO served, um, he, he wasn't made to leave the home because he was not violent. Um, he knew how to go to the line and mm -hmm. not cross that mm -hmm. so that there was nothing that anybody could could do you know as far as the judicial system to to um, intervene, intervene. so um, eventually he was ordered to leave the home and in a few months my daughter came forward and um, after a intervention with me talking to a mom she came to me and said um, I can't believe he's done all this after what he did to our girls and I was in shock and I said, what do you mean? And uh, she told me some events of things that had happened at our house that weren't normal. That your husband at that time had done to other 
people's children, right, is that right, correct? Right, okay. right, just odd behaviors. Mm -hmm. So, um, in talking to her over the next couple of months, she finally disclosed her story. And I realized what I was looking at was um, sexual abuse over a period of about seven years. And when you say she disclosed her story, who are you speaking about? My daughter. Your daughter. Yeah. Your daughter. Yeah. So your daughter then began to come to you over time right. until she finally had the courage to say, right. here's what's been happening. Yeah. She had lived in fear mm -hmm. because of uh, the threats he had made. Um, I think there was threats that he made uh, against me, against her, and that kind of thing. So she was, she was afraid of him. And I think once that he was gone mm -hmm. and she felt safe, mm -hmm. that she was able to tell me. And so what was that moment like for you? Um, it was heart-wrenching. And um, I, I, I call it the night that brought me to my knees. Mm -hmm. That's what I've named it because it, uh, my whole world changed after that night. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about it, she and I discussed it because I felt like it was her story. Mm -hmm. And I wanted her to, to do what she felt like she needed to do with it. And we decided to go to the, to the police department mm -hmm. and disclose. And, uh, that's when things started to, started to unfold. unfold yeah. And so I know, Mindy, when, when we were talking before the program about all of the different aspects of your, of your story, of your daughter's story, about the main points that you wanted to use this airtime to convey. And one of those points was uh, what you just described, that the, all of the events uh, leading up to um, your daughter's disclosure and then those moments initially and immediately after yes. your daughter's disclosure. One of the things that, um, that we had talked about was that was important to you is for you to be able to communicate to the viewer uh, some of those signs and symptoms that you, that you now look back. At the time seemed maybe yeah. odd but didn't yeah. seem abusive. Uh, what were some of those signs and symptoms, if not of his behavior, of your daughter's responses to his behavior? Um, she, like I said, she became very, um, very upset and agitated with him often. Mm -hmm. um, she really didn't want to be around him at all, mm -hmm. and that was one thing I noticed. I noticed over a period of years she had had um, headaches, mm -hmm. terrible headaches. She had had some urinary tract infections. She had uh, terrible nightmares. Mm -hmm. um, just things that, in a sense, looking back aren't really anything big, sure. but when you look at them together, mm -hmm. you sort of start to see the picture of, of what was happening. Mm -hmm. Now, you had mentioned know. having a son as well, um, yeah. and so how was that, those, uh, how were those initial days, how were they on him? Um, he was very confused, mm -hmm. because at the time he was four, mm -hmm. and he and his father were close, and um, he asked me, uh, where's dad? And to the answer those questions to a four-year-old about um, good touches, bad touches, you just really can't do that. You have to do something that's more um, specific for their age. Mm -hmm. And I just told him that dad was gone. He was in timeout because he had made some bad choices. And so speaking of timeout, yeah. uh, let's back up just a bit. So back to that moment where you went to the police department and what happened next um, or in the next few months? The next few months were very, very, I'm lost. What were they, and you know, and actually I'm really glad that you, that you <laughs> use those words, I'm lost, because yeah. so many times we ask victims, we ask their families yeah. um, to tell us with words what it was like when there are no right. words. Well, you feel alone. Mm -hmm. You feel very alone. And that at, that moment, I became a single mother. Mm -hmm. I became a provider for my family. Mm -hmm. My income had just been cut in half. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, going to worry about therapy for my children. And I had also become a statistic. Mm -hmm. Because now I know that one in four women in their lifetime mm -hmm. are a victim mm -hmm. of sexual abuse. So I think the response that we just saw out of you right now, mm -hmm. how overwhelming all of those things to not only re state or recall, but to live through. So your daughter just discloses sexual mm -hmm. abuse about a man that you at one time before all these changes were in love with, right. 
the father of your son, son yeah. um, and and then all kinds of other things took place. And so you talk about losing your business, losing your home, all those kinds of things, or selling your home and, and the financial strains. Um, were, were those strains and consequences a result of him going to prison? Were they a result of a community response? Um, Tell us what happened. I think a bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, because when you're thrown into that situation, it affects every area of your life. I mean, you, it affects you financially, mm -hmm. mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I look, at, I look at all those things and just see how it affects every one of those areas. So this situation, this um, disclosure for mm -hmm. your daughter um, ended up going to trial. Yes. Tell, tell us about that process. Um, trial, trial was tough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's having to take the stand and mm -hmm. tell things to people that you, you tell your child all their life not to say such things right. and, and she's having to uh, tell this to a room full of grown-ups and mm -hmm. actually face the perpetrator while he's there mm -hmm. and the community um, mm -hmm. they are the people that you know and love you are very supportive but I was surprised I think taken aback at how the community responds uh, to you because of their disbelief mm -hmm. They wear blinders mm -hmm. and, and don't want to see the big picture of what's going on because it's not pretty to look at. Mm -hmm. right, right. Not pretty to think about. No, and it's not pretty to live through right. for her, for you, for those that are watching that can relate exactly yeah. to what you're saying. And so um, you had indicated to me that there was a period of time where uh, the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator at that mm -hmm. time, now yeah. we're happy to say that the perpetrator, the convicted perpetrator, uh, really put you all in through some terribly scary times. Yes. Um, what was it like trying to battle uh, what he was doing as well as the community response to what was happening to your family? Um, it was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, like I said, I was scared. Mm -hmm. And I was alone. I didn't want to get out and face the community. Mm -hmm. And I felt guilty. And we shouldn't have felt that way because that was that was not our fault. And what about the situation made you feel guilty? What um, were some of those reactions that you had? Well, the guilt just because I felt like I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I, I should have noticed, you know, mm -hmm. and as a mother, you know, you want to protect your child. Mm -hmm. And I felt shame. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to go out into the community and, and show our face. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to protect her. Mm -hmm. uh, I was angry. Mm -hmm. I was very angry because he had conned us and um, mistreated her mm -hmm. and everything that I had known about my life up to that point was a lie. Our family, I, I looked back at happy times and would smile and think, you know, that's not really our family mm -hmm. because that's not really what was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, Mindy, you you go through the legal system, you go through this mm -hmm. um, really difficult trial experience, and viewers should probably note that many of these cases never make it to trial. Either the perpetrator mm -hmm. pleads out, the victim is intimidated and drops the charges, yes. there's not enough uh, evidence to prosecute. Lots of different reasons yes. why people never have their day, if you would, in court. But your family had their day yes, in court. Yes, we did, and we were very blessed. Yes. What was that like, that moment? when the verdict came down? I'm going to get emotional, but um, it was very empowering. Mm -hmm. It was um, sad, mm -hmm. but it was, you felt justice was served. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it, after the doors were closed and after we went home, it was all still there. Mm -hmm. It didn't go away. Mm -hmm. And you knew that part of it was over, but part of this journey was just beginning mm -hmm. for my family. Sure. Your ex husband received mm -hmm. how many years? Um, he received um, a guilty verdict on all five counts. Each of those counts, uh, he was sentenced to seven years. So a total of 35. So 35 years like you're describing, the gavel hits, mm -hmm. verdicts delivered, the doors close, and now you're left to celebrate, to grieve, to all of this mixture. Yeah. Um, and so I'd like to talk with you about um, that. 
that journey from that moment, because you had such an incredible journey to get to that moment. Right. Right. You're at that moment. Now you've got a son who doesn't have his dad. Mm -hmm. You've got a daughter who is trying to put her life back together. Mm -hmm. um, but then you have you. Yeah. What has that journey been like? Um, I think in the beginning, I think probably the first year after, I, I really ignored my own feelings. Mm -hmm. And I concentrated on the kids to make sure that they were okay. Mm -hmm. After that year, I think I ended up with some depression mm -hmm. because I had ignored a lot of that. I became very emotional and um, that's when I, I felt like that I needed to do something mm -hmm. for me. Well, Mindy, you're your family um, is obviously you're here representing your family and you're here on the Rays of Hope program because um, it's hosted by the Purchase Area Sexual Assault right. and Child Advocacy Center. So obviously you all did access services. Yes. Um, and, uh, and I think you will attest that, at least you have to me, that you benefited from those services. What role did the center play in this journey for you? Um, they were incredible. Um, every time I called, they were there. Mm -hmm. to pick up the phone. Um, they helped us to work as a family unit mm -hmm. to help us start to function together. Not only was uh, Brianna in her therapy and Noah, I think, saw, came to the center a few times, but um, it, as for myself, you know, um, I was able to work with both of them independently and then together as a group mm -hmm. to try to rebuild and, and do things. You had shared with me so eloquently, so passionately, when we were getting ready for today's program about, um, just about that, I don't think I've ever heard it put so so clearly, that, that journey before mm -hmm. getting ready, the disclosure, then the journey to get to trial and holding your breath for the verdict, you get the verdict, and now what, you know? And, and you talked about the role of the center and, and how the services assisted your family, but then you talked about there's a whole piece missing in terms of how to navigate and deal with the community's response and resistance to this topic. Um, talk to me about that. What was that like and what is that like? Even now, you said you sometimes don't get a supportive response from the community. Talk to me about that. Um, I think that this is such an ugly topic mm -hmm. that people don't want to look at it. They don't, want to, they don't want to know what it is. They don't want to see. And uh, when they know that something like this has happened in your life, they are sort of taken aback. Mm -hmm. And they don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. I think it is so important for the community to know and for the, the women, the many women that this has happened to in their life, that it's okay to speak. Mm -hmm. It's okay to say, this has happened and um, this is what happened to me, but it's not who I am. You talked to me, Mindy, about having this moment with your daughter, this moment with your son, this moment with yourself when you decided this happened to us, but it does not define us. Right. Tell me more about that. I said that because um, we were defined were defined by, by um, sexual abuse, and that's how people knew who we were. Mm -hmm. So we're sort of having to grow into our own mm -hmm. and rediscover ourselves mm -hmm. and um, decide that this, turn this thing around and decide that, you know, we want to use this for the higher good, mm -hmm. for the good of the community, for the good of others. Mm -hmm. So it defines us to a, to a point, sure. but it's not who we are or who we can become. And we have to take strength in knowing that. And so, you know, I just want to applaud you on, as the mother, uh, as the leader now for this family, this new defined family, you know, um, I think we share that many times we in this work, in this field, don't get to see yeah. that response. Um, we may see a blaming of a victim, a not believing a victim. So to hear you say, and only did I believe my daughter, at the expense of my marriage. Not only did right. I believe my daughter at the expense of my home, of my business, um, I am encouraging my daughter and my son to use this for good rather than um, for evil or for vengeance or for bitterness. Um, right. 
and I think when I first heard you speak, you said we've begun to replace words like bitterness and unforgiveness and hate with love and forgiveness and restoration. And, and so are there moments, are there days when you think, I'm not going to be able to replace those words. Uh, those, there are moments I'm not going to be able to get through this. And if there are, what advice do you give to people that might be watching that think, I can't replace words like hate with love? What would you say? Um, give it time and look within mm -hmm. and know who you are mm -hmm. and know that you are strong. Mm -hmm. And um, grab your family, bring them close to you, and work through it together and know that you're not alone mm -hmm. in that. Uh, take the support that you get from the community and from your family, if there are any. Mm -hmm. And if not, find support, because mm -hmm. there is support there. Um, call, call Purchase Area Sexual Assault Center. Call, call a community program or whatever that you can get a hold of to, uh, to get the kind of support and protection that you need. Um, I think probably one of the worst uh, things about this type of uh, violation is it happens in darkness mm -hmm. and it happens in cellars and in garages and in dark lit rooms mm -hmm. but my intent and what would make me happy would be for the community to join forces and shed light on this crime mm -hmm. for others. And I, 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 every time I hear you speak, I get a little taken back because that is the mission of um, so many, but it is um, sometimes we are so stifled with fear or stereotypes right. or we don't really want to talk about that or be associated with that, but as you so well describe, it's going to happen anyway. Right. It's happening. We have to combat it with light and with truth and with speaking out, speaking up. You said something to me that... Um, caught me so off guard that I'd like to share with the viewer. You said to me that people still come up to you. <laughs> um, we should say it's been how long? Uh, it's been two to three years. Yeah. Okay. You said that people still come up to you yeah. and ask this question. Do you think she's lying? And when you said that to me, I, I sort of was caught off guard. And, and so I want to pose that very hard question to you, because there may be a viewer that's asking that question of you at this moment, do you think your daughter is lying? What would you say to them? Um, my first thought is why? Why would I want to take her through that? Why would I want to, to do that to my child? Mm -hmm. um, as a mother, I didn't want this to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not something I chose. It's not something that I picked. It's something that happened to us. And, you know, they don't want to believe it. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to believe it either. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, I didn't. I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to know that it was because it was my entire life. Mm -hmm. And I think when I answer them, I just say, no, I don't think she's lying. I know she's telling the truth. And I think there are a lot of people that don't uh, believe because they don't want to believe, That's if right. that makes sense. <laughs> what it would mean for them, right. for their world, for their safety, right. for their children. Right. Um, and I think I'd even like to take it a step further to say, she wouldn't pick it either. No. She wouldn't want it either. Who wants that to be a part of who you are? Um, but it sounds like you're, you're making it of, no, we can't um, change what happened and it doesn't define who we are, but it has shaped who we will become and we're going to choose to do something positive. Right, absolutely. What would have been helpful from the community? Um, I think there were people that were supportive. I can't, sure. I can't say that there was not, but um, from the community, um, I didn't uh, go to the grocery for about a year <laughs> because um, I was afraid. And um, people um, don't realize how much they intimidate you mm -hmm. when you when you go out in public into your community, or mm -hmm. they can you can hear them talking to 
two people behind you in line. Mm -hmm. uh, believe what's mm -hmm. going on uh, when somebody discloses information. Mm -hmm. uh, support them and uh, take interest in this program because I think, you know, we are given so many, um, so many symptoms of domestic violence and, and uh, other, other things, forms of abuse. Mm -hmm. But I think it's hard to talk about the sexual mm -hmm. violence that occurs because it is such a private matter. Mm -hmm. It's such an intimate thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it, it's not about sex, it's about violence and control. Mm -hmm. And I think people have a hard time uh, differentiating that mm -hmm. and uh, it's just a hard thing to wrap your mind around. Mm -hmm. you, you know you speak so eloquently so well you know you can tell I can tell that it comes from your heart you comes from your experience and so I just wanted to thank you so much for being here um, for providing the viewer with the information that they need that we need to become an active member of this solution, active part of this solution. So Mindy, thank you. thank you for being here. And thank you so much for joining us for another edition of the Rays of Hope program. I wanna challenge you to make her story um, a part of your life, to realize that there are victims around you, to join in, to join arms, to join forces like Mindy suggested with the Purchase Area Sexual Assault Center, with your Sunday school class, with your youth group, with your, with your child, um, and commit to make this purchase area a safer for all. Thanks for joining us.